Yeah, well, we love you. We bless you. Thank you for what you carry. I just pray for you. Father, thank you for this um, continued time around your presence, Father. I just prayed for eyes to see and ears to hear. Father, would you just settle our hearts? I just thank you for the spirit of wisdom and understanding. Father, that understanding would come uh, this morning, Father, and there'd be um, impact and change and excitement and increased connection with you as a fruit. We just love you. Bless this beautiful woman of God, Father. Just bless her body, mind, soul, and spirit. Thank you that you encamp angels around her right now in the name of Jesus and just protect her as she speaks. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Good morning, family. <laughs> Thank you, worship team. That was so sweet. How good is that? Right. Um, who has been following or has been here? So either either you've either followed the teachings online or been here, and I've done the first one, which was praise, until the spirit of worship comes, and then we did a teaching on worship. Yes, you can raise your hands. Yay, okay, great. I'm going on to level three, you Xbox players, you. <laughs> um, level three, which uh, um, stay, it's worship until, until the glory comes and stay in the glory. And so I'm going to attempt. Wow, do we feel inadequate on this topic to teach it. Um, I'm going to attempt to teach on the topic of the glory. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Um, I have a way with these topics where I try and give you as much as I can, obviously biblical teaching, but I try and get as logical as I can and give you uh, definitions and explanations according to culture as possible. So I am, I'm going to continue that route, um, but you need to know that the more we go into the depth of Jesus, it's predominantly experiential. So I won't be able to give you all of it. Um, not even a drop, <laughs> but I'm going to try and language it enough that the hunger grows and the sensitivity grows and the wonder grows for the experiential. Is that okay? All right, so I'm going to just make sure there's enough recap. Andrew, you're amazing with your graphics. Um, and we're going to just recap some definitions and I'm going to talk of the definition of glory in like a two-sentence form so you sort of know what we're pursuing and then we're going to expand it from there. Is that all right? So first definition I want to cover quickly is praise. So I've just put it into a sentence, though there was seven Hebrew words for praise, there was a whole teaching on praise and we could probably do 70 more teachings out of that just on thanksgiving and just on agreement. There is so much in this topic. But I've got the act, notice that it's a doing word, the act of expressing approval or admiration, agreement, commendation, laudation, the offering of grateful homage in words or song. Praise is acknowledging God for what he has done, what he is doing, what he will do, and partnered with thankfulness, it is a faith act that must precede the act of worship. Faith without deeds is? So it's a faith act because we believe in him, we act we choose praise. A lot of us feel that we need to feel it, but praise is a choice. It's a faith act. It still obviously is ignited by the Spirit because we, we've come to believe in God because of the grace of the Spirit connecting with our spirit, but it is a choice on our behalf. It's a sacrifice because we're bringing to death anything that keeps us from wholeheartedly expressing His greatness. We're bringing to death whatever is restricting us from giving Him all the glory. All right? Praise is also intercession as it comes into agreement with the will of God and the nature of God. Praise is often accompanied by dancing, shouting, tongues, and corporate celebratory music. I think we had a bit of praise this morning, and there's so many realms of that. Isn't that great? All right, worship. Again, try and condense this, it's so difficult. So I've got reverent honor and homage paid to God or whatever we're worshipping, okay? Adoring, adoring reverence or regard. Worship is acknowledging God for who he is. So I talked about praise and we said what. Worship is who. It becomes more personal. It is the act of bowing down to reverence his majesty. Here Jesus must be crowned 
and must occupy the throne of our lives. Worship is confronting because it is acknowledging who is on the throne. All right? If we struggle to engage in the next step after praise and to worship, to personalize it that little bit more, it might be because something else is on the throne. All right? Worship is where we drink from him and he drinks from us. I love that story about the woman at the well and how he says uh, he, God, watered a sinner and a sinner wanted watered God and both were satisfied. He takes the water that you're offering. You don't have to come perfect. It's about giving everything. All right? And then we've got, there's always room to go deeper in worship. It doesn't cap at one song or at one point of an emotional connection with him. There is so much to explore in the realm of worship. Worship is the spiritual progression from praise. And although we partner with physical expressions such as bowing the head or the body, kneeling or laying prostrate, ultimately worship is an attitude expressed by one who knows that without God, he or she is nothing. Worship is an attitude expressed by one who knows that without God, he or she is nothing. Worship is the expression of our dependence on the person of God. Now that I've seen your love is better than all the others that I've seen, that line wrecks me every time. Worship is realizing that without him, we have nothing and we are nothing. No other love can compare to this great love before us that has redeemed us and restoring us and is calling us into the new and greater things. There's nothing like Jesus. To praise God is to seek God. To worship is to be found by him. We open the door of our hearts in praise and in worship we find him. He finds us and it's an incredible connection. It's amazing where every time we meet, there's a different place we're sitting. It's so good. We praise until the anointing for worship comes and there's a power that rises up in us and upon us to partner with heaven in worship. Praise is ultimately a choice. Worship, there is an anointing that rises up in us. Okay, we engage into. Is that all right? All right. In a nutshell, and this will seem familiar because it's what we're pursuing in praise and in worship, but let's talk about the glory. All right. The glory is the complete person of God, Father, Son, and Spirit. It is also the place of his heavenly abode. So it's not just the person, it's where he is, heaven is. So the kingdom is also in that reality of what the glory is. But the glory is also his goodness, it's the fullness and it's the splendor. You can have an ex a, a reality of glory because you are aware of him. So it's an awareness as well. It's his manifest presence. Now the heart of God, so if we could picture someone sitting and having a conversation and we talk about the weather and then we talk about deeper things, we talk about heart to heart matters. The heart of God is a sphere within the glory. So just like worship gets deeper, the glory has realms. We still tracking? Okay. That's why I need to expand on this topic, not just give you a title. Because sometimes we go, okay, so the manifest presence of God, the, whole, the whole Father, Son, Holy Spirit, I believe in that. That's what we're after. But we actually have no idea what we're saying and we know, don't know what we're looking for. All right? And so when it's actually happening, we can't recognize it sometimes. That's, that's the scary bit. All right. So... So we're looking for knowing him and then knowing him more. That's why Song of Solomon talks about the chamber within the chambers. The hu take us into your chamber within chambers. It's why the, the buildings were even constructed that way, where you go through the gates and then the, the, the holies and then the holy of holies. You have realms that you enter in, even in the spirit with the Lord, that goes deeper and deeper. So we can always long for more and discover more. All right? Let's talk about realms. It's a good word. Realm. Is this helping? Sometimes we say a whole lot of words and we don't realize that we don't know what they mean. Realm. How do Aussies say it? Just through the nose more? Realm. Okay. Like one of those birds at the foreshore. Realm. All right. Okay. The region, sphere, or domain with within which anything occurs, prevails, or dominates. There are three specific spiritual realms. I encourage you, I won't be offended if you have your phone out, jot down notes, otherwise if you have notebooks, this is a very, um, things will line up with things. So if you just write little points, you'll see how it lines up. We have 52 slides or something like that because of this reason. There are points that line up with points. There are three specific spiritual realms. 
the realm of faith, the realm of the anointing, and then the realm of the glory. They're different. All three are different. Each realm contains a dominant theme and a specific protocol for access. All three need very good teaching on. I'm sorry I'm not doing all three, but you'll see how I've touched on all three this whole time. All right? Faith, anointing, and the glory. There's your three. Each realm contains a dominant theme and specific protocol for access. There is a protocol. He's made a way, but he tells us how to come to him. There is a protocol. This is where, when we have that little button in our head where we haven't got an issue with authority and we've dealt with those wounds, but we have a reverence for the majesty of God, when that gets in the right order, we understand protocol. Okay? So if you struggle with, I have to approach him rightly, and you feel shame, the problem's on your end. It needs ministry and it needs healing and it's important. But he does have a way. He says, come to me with thanksgiving. Come to me with praise. Enter this way. And there's a reason and it's for our good. It's not because he's a snob. All right? When speaking of the glory realm, this is the domain or kingdom of God that contains the fullness of God and all of heavenly realities. All right? So it's the fullness. This is that realm. So sometimes when we talk about the glory, we talk about weighty glory. Who here has felt that they've experienced the weighty presence of God? Cool. The term used to signify the manifest um, glory, it was the kavod glory, or kabod glory, depending on how you pronounce the V. Um, it's, It's unseen, but it is physically felt as a heavy weight, often causing a person to fold over or remain prostrate on the ground unable to rise. So it's a heaviness. You actually feel, feel it like a heaviness. Now, some of you would be like, I'm trapped. It's not that kind of heavy. It's not like a boulder landed on you. There is a kindness in the heaviness, all right? But it's a heaviness. It can also be felt in the hands as though you're holding something like a substance, is a heaviness. Sometimes when we're standing like this in praise, I, I feel the weight and I know he's holding my hands. It's the weirdest thing. But it's this heavy grip. Like I Like, it's the same as this, but there's nothing in my hand, all right? Let's go into this a bit more, just because I'm not going to teach on this, but it's an experiential realm within the glory. This word also means honor, and it's connected with the general idea of the word kaved, K-A-V-E-D, which means heavy. Now, the word lechabed, to honor, therefore carries the idea of making some, make something heavy. So we're making something heavy versus I'm making something light. Like this has got more importance, this isn't as important. Does that make sense? So it carries a lot of weight. That person carries a lot of weight when they say things like that to me, or that person's got a lot of influence. It can have that ring to it. So sometimes the kavod is also a revelation of where his influence is in in that time, or that person is going to carry something the Lord wants them to carry. So it's not that they're more important than you, but when he he puts his kavod glory in a moment, you know that he's emphasizing something that is meant to be important. Is that all right? When I feel it on me, it's not like I'm more important. It's like I'm important to you. That's the most important thing to know. <laughs> it's, nothing, it's nothing to do with the rest of the room. It's this you and me and you see me and not only are you fixing what's not great in me, you know, all those things we can step into is I'm important to you. So when we feel the heaviness, it's not you've done something wrong, stay still, child. It's oh man, you're important to me, and he's resting on you. Do you see the difference? All right. In the Old Testament, the kvod is is used variously to describe individuals' wealth or power or majesty or influential position or great honor. You see it in Genesis 31 and 45. Kvod um, can also express fame, reputation, recognition, beauty, magnificence, strength, dignity, and splendor. Can you see how we say God is glory, but we also glorify him? There's so many realms within that word glory. It's the attributes, but also the experience and the reality. I see it, I feel it, and I express it. It's, it's a lot. All right. It can also um, mean respect, excellence, holiness, and greatness. You see those in Exodus 28. <sighs> Hence, the glory of God expresses all of his attributes. I love that. That's, it's so huge because it's God's descriptive word. Um, in the New Testament, we have the word doxa, which means the same. In essence, it's the nature, attributes, and infinite perfection of God. It's his character, 
It's his personality. It is what he is in himself. It's great, eh? It's a word that cannot be unpacked enough because God. And how do we put a word to God? Um, So we'll give you that. And the often experience of that would be a heavy way to cover it. The other one that we often experience is called Shekinah or the golden glory. Who here has experienced the golden glory or the Shekinah glory? Now, this comes in different ways. This could be a bit confusing. As we go along, I might ask again. It's a term used for the manifest Shekinah glory, the golden glory. Visibly appears in physical form. So we actually see this one. Most often as small dust-like particles. Have you, who's had gold dust like on their hands? Yeah? Yeah, me too. It usually has a golden sheen um, appearance. Some people get gold teeth. That's Shekinah. Okay, can also present itself in other colors. I know this is where we're like, ah! can also present in other colors or with crystal clear glimmer on your hands. Most notice, notably, this physical manifestation generally appears coming up through the pores of the skin. Now oh, that's just crazy, right? But at other times can also fall through the atmosphere. Anyone seen Shekinah fall? Anyone want to see Shekinah fall? Anyone wondering why we're not seeing Shekinah fall? How do you feel when you walk in a room and you don't feel like all of you is welcome? Anyone want to see the glory of God? Is all of him welcome here? Shekinah glory is the visible manifestation of his presence to mankind, and this is when God's glory transcends the spiritual realm, the unseen, and it impacts the natural realm. In Hebrew, it means a neighbor. It's connected by its root word, mishkan, which is one of the words used for the tabernacle. Isn't that cool? The one that Moses constructed. It was, it's connected to that same word. The concept, therefore, communica- communicates the idea of dwelling or dwelling with. The Hebrew biblical use would be the dwelling place of God or the place where God rests. So when we see the Shekinah glory, there's a manifestation of the place where God rests. Is he welcome here for your needs and then you can go on or is he welcome here to stay? I'm not just talking in a corporate setting. I'm talking at home, on the street. It's the Shekinah presence, this glimmer, the gold dust, the signs and the wonders, the manifest presence of God. Is it welcome to rest? Shekinah is related to the immediate and intimate, immediate and intimate activity of God. It happens now, in the moment. There it is. It is the immediate and intimate activity of God, the splendor of the Lord while he is present in the now in action, and in allowing others to know him. It's great, eh? Hallelujah. Oh, God, we are hungry. I think it's really important that we need to understand something. This isn't for... um, this isn't for people who are called to extravagant things with gifts of healing or this, this, this sort of encounter with the glory isn't for people who have more time. It's not for people who lead ministries. It's, it's important that we understand that we are all made for the glory. This is actually the main thing. This is what we're made for. I'm not saying we're made for this manifest thing that we just get happy on. I'm saying we're made for knowing God. We're, ma- we're made for the glory. I'm going to go into this a bit more because it's an easy sentence we hear a lot, all right? Did you know that you are specifically made for the glory? The glory of God was a gift to mankind in creation, and it is the inheritance of every child of God. Not your successful life, though that's also the promises of God. He always take you, but he takes you from glory to glory. His, his inheritance for you, when you said yes and you believe in the blood of Jesus and you appropriated it and you said, I want the Holy Spirit to live in me, your inheritance was and is the glory of God. That's your promise. That's what we say we believe in your promises. That's the promise, is the inheritance of God. Is it what we long for most of all? We have become his inheritance and he has become ours. That's what happened. 
That's the beautiful exchange. When we enter into God's glory, we dwell in his very presence. We receive his love and grace. We understand, this is amazing, understand his heart. I don't even understand my heart, so this is awesome. We understand his heart. We learn his will. Isn't that what we want? And we experience his divine power. How many of you have got people that you know need the power of God to hit their life? That power transforms lives. There are sa- they're saving, healing, and delivering. And it enacts miracles and wonders that reveal God's majesty all unto him. Yet many Christians, I'm in this, yet many Christians are not living in his glory. For various reasons, we are settling for far less in our relationship with God as we daily serve him. For various reasons, we are settling for far less in our relationship with God as we're serving him. Jesus prayed to the Heavenly Father in John 17 on the eve of his crucifixion, so it's probably quite an important prayer. And he says, And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. What was the goal? That they may be one. Not that they may be seen for all their signs, wonders, and miracles, or that they may be seen for how they love each other. All of that is the kingdom. But that they may be one just as we are one. The goal is oneness. And you are made for oneness with God and each other. <laughs> Jesus has given believers the same, the same glory the Father gave him. The same. The same. He didn't have extra portions. The question we have to therefore ask ourselves, without any self-condemnation, just with, with being willing to, he- to have the light of the truth come in, let revelation hit. The question we must therefore ask ourselves is, are we living according to the glory we've received from Jesus? Are we experiencing this reality? Are we experiencing oneness? Are we dictating oneness? Are we experiencing oneness or are we dictating oneness? It's good questions, eh? Like, what are we doing unless we're asking these questions? So it's not a condemnation sitting. It's like, what are we doing? What is this about again? It's the beginning of the year. Okay? The glory of God is not just a theological concept to be learned. It is a reality that can be continually experienced This is God's desire for us. It is our fulfillment and it's our inheritance to live in this reality of oneness. Moses understood this experiential realm and that is why he said to God, show me your glory, not give me a scripture on this. And the Lord backed it up with scripture. He got his Ten Commandments after seeing the goodness of God. Isn't that amazing? Show me your glory. Show me the most intimate aspect of your nature. Exodus 33. 33. Many people have no idea what the glory realm really is because they've never experienced it. Either it's personally they never have or through the church or the ministry that they've been um, committed to, but yet until you experience it, we're not going to fully understand what I've even been trying to describe here. It is, first, it is first experienced but then backed up with theology. We need both, all right? Moreover, without continuous revelation of the glory of God, we'll become spiritually stagnant. We will become old wineskins. We need a constant balance between theology and manifestation. Theology, manifestation. Where's the Spirit saying that in the Word? Wow, this is what I'm experiencing with with the Spirit right now. We need that constant balance, and we must pursue both. But often with the glory, the experience comes first. Continual pursuit of the experience of his presence and the knowledge of him hand in hand, revelation fed by understanding, the revelation is actually the manifestation. 
That's what the whole book of Revelation is, by the way. It's a massive written-down manifestation. So we have this revelation fed by understanding that follows, actually activates us. That's how we feed. Revelation. Oh, wow, that's what God's doing. Revelation. Wow. I don't often understand in the moment, but I track. And then he brings understanding. Does that make sense? How can I know him? How can I know what he's doing straight away? We just follow and then he reveals it, all right? We're not ahead of God. I don't think I could ever be ahead of God. So he's revealing it in a manifest way and then we track with understanding and scripture and relational conversation about who this character is that we're pursuing, all right? It's the fire and the fuel. Manifestations, the fire, the understanding is your fuel. You need both, all right? One without the other can easily lead to slumber, deception, religion, apathy, self-led spirituality, and that God is just here for my needs. He dictates the oneness we come into understanding. Do you understand? Woo! Are we all right with this? It's very nerve-wracking. I understand. It's just it's a whole lot of, I don't know. Let's go. I'm going to bring this into, there are, I felt like, how do I approach this topic? And there was like 70 doorways, and so I had to pick one. So I'm going to bring this in with a bit of fun, but I'm going to bring it into, obviously, the praise and, and the worship aspect and, and just show you a bit of, I don't know. I'll just go this route and we'll, we'll get there. But you'll see how it all connects a bit better because I've talked about the three realms, the faith, the anointing, and the glory, and we've talked about... Um, praise and worship and the, and the glory. And I just want to bring them all together and you'll see how here. We're going to talk about the three realms of the Spirit. We're going to go into that a bit more, all right? Ezekiel 47, 3 to 5, who knows what that's about? Who knows? Quote me your scriptures, peeps. It's about that. All right. <laughs> he measured off a thousand cubits and then led me through the water that was ankle deep. Um, he measured off another thousand cubits and led me through water that was knee deep. He measured off another thousand and led me through water that was up to my waist. Then he measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in, a river that no one could cross. Do you want to swim in that one? All right, here's a bit of fun. In our own lives and throughout the scriptures, we see God working in threes. He's the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. In divine collaboration, they're inviting us into salvation, baptism, and the manifest presence of his glory. The number three gives us a picture of completeness, as it is the first spiritual perfect number, all right? In speaking of the death burial and resurrection of our Lord, we're given a prophetic understanding of the first day, the second day, and the third day church. Is this fun? Arising in the kingdom, the power, and the glory. These are all the promises and realities of scripture. Jesus arose conquering death, hell, and the grave. These are all three different things. On the third day, after ministering for three years here on the earth, and at the time he was only 33 years old. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he is the way, the truth. It's like they like to rhyme with three the whole way through scripture. In terms of the blessing, it was passed down through the lineage of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And in the life of the believer, we're given the trifold opportunity to manifest a 30-fold, a 60-fold, and a 100-fold manifestation. Uh, multiplication with the command to become witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, which includes the rest of the world. It, there's something throughout scripture that it constantly points at threes. It's random. And they're all different topics, don't worry, but it's, it's just interesting. They really understand numbers in Hebrew culture and what they mean. And the Lord didn't just speak. He spoke with understanding of that culture and through that culture. So there were threes. So when I say there were three spiritual realms, that's for a reason. There's a completeness in that for the Lord. He's not just picked a number, all right? The first one we talked, I just touched on these, but I'm going to open them. The first one was the realm of faith, good. The second was the realm of, now these two are very different, yes? Who feels they understand what the anointing is? Good. This is why we're here today. Good. <laughs> and then the third is the realm of the Yes, which is the realm that we, we feel that the Spirit, especially in the end times, is leading into us into. This is where we're going, 
All right? So we need to grasp those first two really well if we want to go to the glory. So that scripture we read out, Ezekiel had a vision of the river flowing from the temple and was introduced to its flowing waters step by step. Isn't that kind? We got gotcha. you. We're introduced to the river of God step by step. All right? We don't necessarily come into the things of God all in one go. Even those who have met God in a great encounter and given their lives to them then have to do the journey of discovering relationship with him. We do not come into the things of God all in one go. We may suddenly experience something gloriously, but the reality is that the spirit of truth is leading us all on a journey. So, I need to say this now because I felt it in the room, but I was waiting because I had it in my, my notes. Don't become discouraged by your lack of experience with God. Revelation is always progressive. In the same way that Ezekiel experienced the river by first dipping his feet into the water, then up to his ankles, God will do that for each one of us in an area of our faith. He's going to grow us if we're willing. He just is. We always keep moving, all right? So as we continue to walk humbly before the Lord with a teachable spirit, yay, so many things we learn on the journey, <laughs> teachable spirit, he introduces, he introduces us to the waters that are knee-deep. Ooh. And at this level, we begin to understand the realm of anointing. So we've done ankle deep, and we're understanding, I believe in Jesus. I think there's such a thing as a God, and I think he wants a relationship with me. And I'm learning he's good, and this is what he's done. He died on the cross, and the blood is enough. And we're learning a whole lot ankle deep, aren't we? How many of us have missed a whole lot of teaching we could still be doing ankle deep? How many of us are like, wow, I actually don't have much of an established faith, even though I've grown in my relationship with him? Huh? Yeah. So it's always good to be learning more in the ankle deep water. All right? It is not a shallow thing. It is just an, it's a realm. We need to have that constantly going. You can't get to knee unless you've done ankle. All right? So we continue to walk and we get to knee deep. This, at this level, we begin to understand the realm of the anointing. Now, the anointing comes with greater power. But we can't, we can't disregard our initial experience or the experiences of those who still stand in ankle. It's not less, all right? This is all the same river and we're all learning it. So instead, we know that if we had not been, if not been for the shallow waters, we wouldn't be where we are now. So we have to really have a great respect for where people's uh, revelation is at and yet always be calling people deeper into the deeper things of God. Is that all right? Nothing shallow in a sense of lacking worth. It's really valuable where you are with the Lord. Right now is so valuable, and he's done that with you, but it doesn't mean where it's where he wants you to stop. Is that all right? Everything in God leads to something greater. Even our salvation experience in Christ is not the end all, but rather the opening of a new horizon of spiritual exploration under the protection of his blood and the doorway of the cross. All right? In him we live, we Oh, we move. In him we live and ah, and have our being. In him we live and yes. All right. There is always a moving in the spirit. We go from the realms of faith to anointing, from ankle deep to knee deep waters. And yet Ezekiel was led to the waters that were at his waist. And in this realm we are introduced to the glory of God. And yet again, this was just the beginning. Because where did the waters go? above his head and he could no longer cross. Who here is like, oh wow, this is exposing my control issues. Hey. Oh, you guys are amazing. I'm putting my hands up, I'm always learning. <laughs> it's okay, but you guys are great. Lead me there, people, lead me there. <sighs> All right. Once we begin to touch the glory, we discover that there are realms within that realm. We are swept into the depths of the spirit in waters that are way over our head. And this is the realm we can swim in. And this is the realm we can now live in. So we're meant to live from this realm. We're meant to live. Where are you going? Where are you working? Where are you loving your family? We're meant to live from this realm. Not you're meant to live. We're meant to live from this realm. It's available to us. It's our inheritance. Oneness is the whole thing. We've been given the portion. So we're meant to live from this realm. Okay? Okay? 
All right. So if we want to experience the fullness of God in all of his supernatural goodness, we must understand the three realms, not just the one. And then we begin to understand the three realms, we can accelerate through them because we can actually identify them. And each realm is a portal into something greater as they interact with each other. Am I speaking slightly like I should pull out my wand? I'm sorry. I said portal and I felt like people were like, Harry Potter. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> they stole our words. No, it's okay. <laughs> Once you comprehend this dynamic of the spirit, you'll quickly move within the glory. Sometimes what we often use in different ways. So I've talked about water and going deeper. But how many of you heard the language that in worship and praise we ascend the hill? It's the same. We're ascending. We start with praise. Worship continues, and we ascend the hill to the holy of holies. That's the whole language is that we are going higher. We are going into who he is. So you just drink or leap, whichever way, keep the movement is the whole, is the whole point. Is that all right? All right, so let's understand these three realms in the context of praise, worship, glory. Are we still tracking? It's lots of content, and I can feel like mice spinning. Mine are. Good. How many of you have mice that chew as well? <gasps> yes. <laughs> All right. Okay. <laughs> Motherhood. Uh, okay. Just as there are three realms in the spirit, there are also three dimensions within mankind. Ah, three. We've talked a little bit on this before. before. The first dimension is the spirit man. The second dimension is the soul. And the third is the physical body. We're going to have charts. This really helps me. I like charts. Do you like charts? Okay. Interestingly enough, the three dimensions of mankind respond to the three realms of the spirit. That's cool, right? The first dimension of mankind, the spirit man, responds to the realm of faith. Where do we first believe? In our spirit. Cool? Do you see how the choice is still spirit-led? If you're, it's true, because my spirit has chosen this as my truth, and the, the spirit has become one with my spirit. So we have faith. Your spirit man is the initial point of contact for any interaction with the spirit realm. When God brings the revelation of salvation to our lives, it is our spirit man that reaches out in faith to receive it. Just like we would reach out in faith for healing for a friend, you reach out in faith from your spirit man and receive salvation. It's great, eh? This is where it's happening. We cannot receive the blessings of God in bodily form until we have first received them in our spirit man. Ta-da! Funny line there, because people encounter God and they haven't believed, but it always just goes boop, usually at the same time. All right. The impartation of God always comes first in the spirit before it manifests physically. That's why our spirit man dimension corresponds with the realm of faith. Remember, praise is an act of faith, all right? That's what we talked to faith. Praise is an act of faith. Where does praise come from? The spirit. So do you need to feel it to praise? Hey, we're understanding this a bit better, Yes. Keep nodding. Track with me. If you're feeling sleepy, go. I shake that off, Jesus. Keep my eyes open. We're not going to let dullness come into revelation this morning, all right? Keep warring for your truth this morning. He's got it for you. So faith is a spiritual choice, all right? On the other hand, our soul, mind, will, and emotions is the dimension that responds to the realm of the anointing, okay? That's why we say then the anointing comes upon us and we can... Worship. Worship is from the anointing, which is actually soul. So some people struggle with worship because it's like they're just crying everywhere and yelling weird things, and it's all really expressive and hold it in. All this, what's going to come out if I open my mouth? Like it really is a bit more daunting because now it's not just spirit, spirit, and a great little thing happening up here, though technically spirit to spirit means I activate my faith, but pray, worship now is this whole, my heart comes into the equation, all right? We don't leave the heart behind, ever. <sighs> Often in the anointing, you feel something and your emotions are at an all-time high. If they're yielded to what he's doing, sometimes you can really weep. It's not uncommon for people to laugh or cry or feel great comfort and healing or excitement when the anointing touches them. Isn't that great? 
It involves a relationship. When we encounter the realm of the anointing, therefore, it connects with our soul dimension and we feel an awareness of the spirit, so it's never not one without the other, the heat of God or the electricity of his power. Who's felt the heat of God? Great. Who's felt electricity or like the power of God in the room? Good. This is great. And we must worship. It is a compel to worship. That's what the anointing does. It compels. The spirit is leading the heart, not the spirit is leading the heart. Do you understand the difference? Sometimes we've whipped ourselves into something and it's actually the choice of faith awakens because we've opened the door of our heart. We've gone, sure, because we don't leave our heart behind even in an act of faith. So we've just told our heart, this is what we're doing. I promise it'll be good. Hey! And we just go with the truth because our spirit-led reality, because we're led by the spirit, aren't we? We're not led by the heart. We're led by the spirit, but our heart is one. It's one by what the spirit is doing. And so when we come into that place of anointing, it's like the goodness has just swirled. And our heart's like, this is amazing. Do you see the difference? All right. (sighs) Feeling things in the anointing happens in our soul realm. Even though feelings first appear in the soul realm, they are a result of what has been imparted to our spirit man. And what begins in the spirit flows from our spirit man into our hearts. It all gets firmly planted, becomes this amazing watering and soul healing process, and then finally it'll come out in our physical body. Because we're three, right? We can't deny the third one just because we might not see that part in heaven or whatever people believe. We're spirit, soul, and body. He made us that way. So if he's doing something in our spirit that's affecting our soul, it will come out through our... Who knows that if they have unhealthy areas in their heart, sometimes sickness comes through their body. We've been learning that, yes? Just as much when the Spirit of God and the manifest presence of God is hitting your soul, how much more does that come through in your body? It is in our bodies that we respond to the realm of the glory. So let's look at this. We see an example of this at the dedication of Solomon's temple, 2 Chronicles 5. The people of Israel were praising and worshipping God. When the cloud of his glory descended upon them, the fire of God consumed the sacrifice, and the smoke of his glory filled the atmosphere. And it was such a powerful encounter that the ministers, the priests, could not perform their service. In other words, they couldn't do what they normally did. Worship, I am offering everything, partnering in with what's happening in the anointing. Glory, I can no longer do anything. Do you see the difference? Their bodies were responding to the weight of God's magnificent glory. This explains why many people's experience feeling a strong vibration or a numbness or a shaking or even falling down in the atmosphere of the manifest glory. Here their flesh has begun to yield to the glory of God. How many feel awkward when I talk about that? How many of you don't want to put your hand up because that would be awkward? (laughs) (laughs) It's okay. Usually what, this is really important. Uh, I think in the past, we've done really well with this, but in the past when truth comes in the room, you feel really awkward and then you feel shame. It's not the reality. If you love Jesus, you love the truth, right? He is the truth. So when light comes in, when new teaching comes in, with greater revelation, it's not to produce shame, it's to produce hunger and repentance but hunger. So don't, please don't feel that if you're the only person not, or if you're the odd, it's not that. It's, a, an, it's an open-armed welcoming you in kind of reality. When the light turns on, you're invited in. Is that okay? So just expose that one if it's happening to you, because it ain't meant to be happening, and, and take it to prayer ministry. Or just say, Lord, your kindness is leading me to you right now, and this is your light, and it's okay. The light is good, all right? So this explains why there's sometimes a whole lot of manifestations in the physical. It's actually that because of the journey of what's been happening, spirit, soul, body is finally yielding to the glory of God. Some of us, it's like this journey. Others will hit that moment in one, two, three. So you can't really time it and go, that one was God. Mm, That one wasn't. You know what I mean? Like it's literally he's moving in a sovereign way and he can hit spirit, soul, body all in one go. All right? When our flesh falls down, our spirit rises up in strength. Yeah, Yeah, it's almost like 
essential to have your body yielded to the Lord. <laughs> oh, I yield my mind to you. I yield my heart to you. I yield my, my body to you. Not because I don't want them engaged, but because I need my spirit to have the strength for this season. I need my spirit to grasp what you're doing first. Do you know what I mean? All right. In the glory, God does, what, does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. It's not he takes over and he becomes the controlling man. He does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. How many of you have things in your life or things in your own heart and you're like, I just need God to intervene? Yeah? yeah? Praise, worship, the glory. In the glory, God does for us what we cannot do for ourselves. He's shown us the way. He's called us to live in it and it's our inheritance. We don't need to wait for a great awakening. We don't need to wait for a great speaker. It's not something that just ministers get to experience. It's our portion. All right, so this chart hopefully helps you see and understand better the flow of what we've been exploring. Praise until the spirit of worship comes, worship. So I've put in here rest because technically when you're in the glory, you no longer are partnering or co-laboring. It's when the Lord is doing something sovereignly, all right? Uh, sometimes we're like, I don't need to praise because he's already done it all. The rest is when we're in him, and sometimes we need to come into agreement with him to be in him, all right? So we praise, we worship, and you enter the rest. It literally manifests in the room, or it manifests in your spirit as you're walking down the street with the Lord, all right? Does that make sense? When I was studying this and preparing it, I said, wow, and I was enjoying it in the whole sort of example of the water at your ankle, and then at your knee, and then at your waist, and then woo, and all that's scary for me even. And I said, wow, and the Lord said, yeah, where do you think lukewarm might be? And I was like, oh, if it's on this chart, I'm going to assume somewhere by the ankle. Like, would you say the same if it's on this chart? Lukewarm's possibly down by the ankle. And he said, no, it's right up here in number two. where we get to dictate. We enjoy it for a bit because it's lovely, and then we're like, oh, we'll stop now. I want to go do that. And so we're having a heart dictatorship of this relationship. He said, and I was stung by this. I cried, because that's me. It's me too, not you. This is me. He's lukewarm. When I say, oh, it's that. It's when you long for the anointing. You taste a bit of the power of God. It's great. You see some wonders. Then you go on and do your other things you enjoy to do too, and then you plan your life this way. But then we come back to him when it's not working. And... But you don't think, hey, there's a greater portion for me than this. Some of it is purely wounds and ignorances. It's not you're being an idiot. It's literally there's a blindness. But you need to understand that he's called us to live in the glory. He's called us to live in his rest. He's called us me. He's called me to live from this place of oneness 24-7. And he says it's possible. Yeah? All right. How do we transition from worship, the anointing, to the glory? Rest. I don't know. <laughs> no. Okay, we'll go here. Uh, just as we study the transition between praise and worship, faith and anointing. I want to emphasize the differences and the way we transition from the anointing to the glory. I've said it in a few sentences, but I'm going to really emphasize it this morning. Okay? Worship into rest. I also want to touch on faith briefly outside of the context of praise a little bit more, and I want to have a better understanding of the anointing, because I think most of us put our hands up for saying we don't really know what that is. All right? The more we understand all three, the better we understand their differences, and then we realize how it moves. Is that okay? All right. Faith in a nutshell. Romans 12, verse 3, I say in a nutshell, and I'm like, oh, because it really is lots of teaching on this, and it's important teaching, which we shall do. We, we. Uh, Romans 12, 3, tells us that everyone has been given a measure of faith by God, all right? He gave us this measure of faith to enable us to interact with the spiritual realm while physically living on earth. He gave us a measure of faith to enable us to interact with the spiritual realm while physically living on earth. That's why you have faith. Faith is not so that... <laughs> it's not a pebble in your pocket. <laughs> okay, it's not, it's not a glory thing on your shelf that you get to celebrate. It's not part of your like, oh, and I'm a Christian and it goes on your CV. He gave us this measure of faith to enable us to interact with the spiritual realm while physically living on earth. This is not our home. When you say yes to Christ, this is no longer your home. Heaven is our home. 
Oneness is our home. The Father's lap is our home. His company is our home. How many of you have traveled so much that you've come to realize that home is where the heart is? Home is where people are? Home is family? When we say yes to Christ, he becomes our home. He gave us a measure of faith to enable us to interact with the spiritual realm, with home, while physically living on earth. Does that help? Faith is, the be- faith is the believer's spiritual antenna to hear beyond the natural dimensions. It is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11. So just before raising Lazarus from the dead, Jesus said to Martha, Lazarus' sister, did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? See the word glory there? John 11. Did I not say to you that if you would believe, you would see the glory of God? Faith is a prerequisite for seeing the glory because having faith means you believe in what God can do. It is the ability to believe the unreasonable or the impossible. There is so much more to faith. Faith was given to us so we can reach beyond time into eternity and pull it into today and into now. We get to go and grab something from home and pull it into today. And in reality, we always do this and we talk to Jesus, but heaven come is here. So we grab something from home and we pull it in today. It's around us. It's our substance right here, right now. Jesus is here. All right? It's a whole different way of thinking and a whole different way then of living because if we live by faith, then we know we have more than enough. Do you understand the difference when we start to understand what faith is? What are we living anchored in? What's the truth? I'm not saying walk around and make 100 decrees every morning and then you're good like some workout. I mean, the truth is the truth because who is the truth? Jesus is the truth. And so in this relationship with him, he is the anchor for my soul. And so I have to agree with who he is for the truth to be real for me today. Does that make sense? Because reality isn't your real anymore. Home is. Do you see how faith works? So much in it. There's a difference between believing in something with the measure of faith that God has given us and then God exercising his own faith. The realm of the glory is the latter, God himself in faith and action. So what he believes and does on his own compared to what we believe based on our faith and what we're able to do based on our anointing, all right? There's a prerequisite to seeing God himself in the realm of glory, and that is our faith. So we operate from faith and from glory, but the glory realm is when God reveals who he is. He operates with his own belief of himself. This is who I am. Does that make sense? All right, anointing, just a snippet. Please do not think you understand the anointing fully by this. It is a drop that hopefully gives better understanding. Just as each believer has been given a measure of faith, he or she has also been given a measure of anointing. It's a particular gift or gifts. Some have many, some have less. Not more special, not less special. All right, to fill God's purposes. For example, 1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 11. The anointing is the power of God provided to enable believers to carry out the work of ministry. What's our ministry? It's where we are planted, right? When you go to work, loving your family, loving your neighbor. It's the power of God provided to enable you to carry out your work of ministry. That's the anointing. When you go to work and you do a whole bunch of stuff and people go, you're just so good at that. That's the grace of God on your life. When you make a really brilliant good cake, I don't know how to do that. But when you do that, that's, and you enjoy it and it doesn't feel as costly as someone else who has to meticulously follow the recipe and still suck at it, you have a grace of God on your life for making cakes. It's not shallow, it's wonderful. Because God makes great cakes, and he wanted some of you to do that too. It's lovely. It's so relational, all right? It is also used to send men and send women into ministry. It can be the empowering of your new call or your new life or the shift in your transition, and you realize the grace is lifted off one thing, and he places it into the new. So it can move, all right? That's Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, Acts 13, 1 to 3. The anointing is God's power working through us to do what he wants done on earth. For example, he may say to one person, you are called to be a missionary. 
So I will give you a portion of my power as well as the necessary faith to enable you to fulfill this calling. See how important it is to know what you're called for? Because what you're called for, already you have been portioned the necessary power and faith to enable you to fulfill it. To fulfill it. All right. Now, each measure of anointing given to believers is made up of various levels or depths. Don't you love all this language? One level is equivalent to a step that must be taken, or it's ascending. All right? as we progress in our ability to move in the anointing and grow spiritually. I'm not convinced anointing so much grows, though I know it can, as much as that we grow to learn to utilize our anointing. Does that help? So as we progress in our ability to move in that anointing and to grow spiritually in relation to it, so no step can actually be skipped. Each step represents an essential aspect of our maturity. How many people have like, realized that they have the gift of God in their life and then they've crumbled? Because we need maturity to steward the gifts that he's given us. It's very dangerous to put someone in leadership because of their gifts. Do you understand why now? Because we need maturity to be able to carry the anointing. All right? And we need to do those steps. All uh, right. Okay, it represents an essential aspect of maturity and in spiritual understanding and in relationship with God. So we actually grasp a lot more of how this works here and how this works here. All right? Both. We must go from step to step, deeper and deeper, without trying to miss one level. Until we reach the depth at which we have fully developed the measure and the anointing we have received. We grow into what we've received. And at this point, the only option available to us is to enter into the glory. How many of you sitting here are not feeling like, oh, dang it, this is hard work, but going, oh, I may have like so much given to me and I haven't really realized it and I haven't grown into it to recognize what I've, been rece- what I've received. Yay, comma, that is all of us. We've been given the glory. We have no idea, but we get to do steps and steps and grow into what we have received. Does that make sense? You won't know, you just got to go. A minister of God cannot force the anointing on people. I might want to release my gift of whatchamacallit on someone else, and that's lovely. And I can pray a release of the encounter, of the portion that I have. May they taste it, may they know it. But at the same time, someone has to grow that to get it. And it's faith that attracts anointing. You can have someone pray something over you, but you actually have to appropriate it by faith. You get a prophetic word, you're called to this, you're called to this, you're called to this, and your spirit goes, that's true, I know it's true, that's great, but you have to appropriate it by faith for the next few years. Faith attracts that anointing on your life. They feed each other. Do you understand how praise attracts worship? Faith attracts the anointing, all right? So having the anointing is not the same as moving in the glory. Sometimes we've said it is because we've seen powerful gifts on people being utilized. It's not the same as moving in the glory. But it all is included in God's attributes. Faith is part of the glory. Anointing is part of the glory. But the anointing is only part of, and we need to understand that. So this, is, this is good. This, is, this, this, this blew my mind. This is not my brain. This is my research. Okay. It's only one aspect of his power. How cool is this? Just for a side topic. A simple example. God's power in the area of ministry is called the anointing. God's power in the area of the law is called the authority. God's power in the area of spiritual warfare is called his might. God's power in the area of territory is called dominion. Different powers. Great, eh? When someone's operating in the anointing or in the power of God, they're not operating in all of those usually. It's usually just one or two. But the dominion, which is the highest level of power, that is what Adam received when he was created. (sighs) So we can't really even talk about the power of God as if it's all the same. We actually have to long to encounter who God is and have all of his power present because of him. 
not because of our anointing. Do you understand? Each of us carries portions of him. Does that help? All right. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 4 to 5, we learn that God has given us the spirit, the anointing, as a guarantee or a deposit or a down payment for the glory. It is the mark of our destiny inheritance. So we know that when we taste the anointing of what's more to come, it's not the stopping point. It's not our lukewarm position. We haven't reached the max. When we experience the anointing of God on our lives and we operate with grace and ease, we haven't hit the, the top. That's not the goal. The goal is not to walk in, in a sense of anointing and grace and to know our calling. That's not the goal. The goal is oneness. All right? The anointing is honestly just a drop before the downpour. The anointing, as well as faith, prepares us to receive the glory, which is God's manifest presence. So in short, faith calls the anointing, but the anointing calls the glory. All right? So just recognizing the power of God and where the ease of God is moving. In a worship set, we're always following. We don't know where we're going. We're just following. We're reckoning, recognizing where the ease of God is going. We're, we're partnering in with where the grace of God is moving that morning. That's called work. It's coming into agreement with the anointing in the room. All right? Because the anointing attracts the glory. It's like putting bait out for mice. It's not what I mean. Anyway, glory. All right, this is going to unfold a bit clearer, I hope. Are we still good? You guys are great. Is it opening some topics in your head? Yeah. Are you chewing quietly? Okay, good. Not like my husband with bubble gum. I love him, but I'm like, bub. All right, glory. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Lukey. Okay. We can operate in faith and anointing through sacrifice, yielding, growing in our relationship, co-laboring, and activating. So that's how we operate in faith and anointing, through sacrifice, through yielding, through growing in our relationship, co-laboring, and activating. But the glory realm is different. Here the manifest presence operates according to God's sovereignty. He does what he wants, when he wants, and in the way he wants, without depending on your faith, without any acknowledgement of your gifts or your anointing. It is God doing his works without bringing in the participation of human beings. How many times your friends are like, how can God be real? He didn't stop that huge crash that happened in that country and everyone drowned. Yes? And we're like, well, he's sort of sovereign, but he's not sovereign because it's, he's given the earth to us and it's our responsibility and we do that whole teach. The glory is where God is sovereign. In some way, we're kind of meant to be living like that where he is permitted, because we've been given authority, to move as he wants to move. Do you understand, sometimes he's not moving because we're not permitting him to move. Or we want it when there's a tragedy, but we don't permit him to move in our lives. Do you understand the difference? Yeah, all right, good. The presence of God cannot be provoked, stirred up, or manufactured, yet it is attracted through worship. It's attracted because we've positioned ourselves rightly. It's actually authentic. It's pure. It's truly what we're asking. We're not bribing any longer. Do you understand the difference? We're not making it about, you need to do it because I need you to do this now. Wow. We're actually, we're actually asking him rightly. Like, the Lord won't let you abuse him. That's not his understanding of love, and so he won't receive it that way. He will let you be you on your healing journey, but he won't respond to an abusive question that would be teaching you to, teach, to speak to him like that. He won't teach you to love him poorly. It's actually a really important part of love because we don't do this well as Christians. We don't put boundaries down on each other because that wouldn't be loving. But he does not receive love from you if it's abusive. He understands you and he cares for you and he adores you, but he doesn't receive your love from you if it's abusive. That's why he says, come to me with praise, come to me with worship, because you are purifying your heart into appropriating the right love to the right God. Does that make sense? It's why it's for you so that you are holy before him. Even if you've come with your junk, appropriating it is holy before him because that's, that's love. 
You can't come to him like a slot machine and then wonder why it's not working. Is that all right? It can't be provoked. It can't be stirred up. It can't be manufactured. It's not loud music and it's not clouds and, and lights. And I'm not opposed to those things. You just can't manufacture the atmosphere of Jesus. You can meet Jesus, I promise you, I've had it, in the middle of Mozambique when you've walked through sludgy water and crabs and underneath a tree with dust and there's no music and there's a whole bunch of people clapping and the Spirit of God can hit that space very richly. He doesn't need this. This is an offering of our gifts to him, but he doesn't need it. He needs the appropriate pursuit. He needs come to me rightly. Does that make sense? In the glory, God will heal. He will deliver and transform people without the use, without the use, this is where it's like, whoa, without the use of their faith and without the anointing. This is where we're singing, you are good, you are good, and someone in the back corner there gets healed from something. Like, no one prayed for her. What's that? And that's coming to him rightly and exercising our faith, but none of us exercised our faith for that person. That's him moving on his own accord. Do you understand the difference? Without the use of our faith or anointing. When we are operating under the anointing, we are co-operating with the power of God. I am working with integrity. I'm yielding to the Spirit. I'm doing my office work today, and I'm digging this hole over here today, and I'm pouring in my energy and working under the grace of God where things make sense, and I solve that problem with ease where some others might find difficult, right? That's called cooperating with the power of God, and therefore, at the end of the day, hands up who can say, I'm tired. I did a good day's work. I'm tired. Co-laboring equals you're still tired at the end of the day. The anointing can still be tiring. So if you're thinking that you shouldn't be doing this because it's not God because I'm tired, that's not necessarily true. Co-laboring can be tiring. You hearing me? So if you're like, "Mm, I'm feeling the, the weight of this one, I don't think it's Jesus. No, 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 no. The anointing has weight. It has, you get tired because you co-labor. You give your everything with him, all right? And by the time we're finished, we're tired because God is using our humanity. He's partnering in with our loaves and fishes. Pretty cool, eh? Luke 8, 48, the woman with the issue of blood. He said, I felt power going out of me. Jesus felt something leave. He was more tired afterwards. Something zapped. All right? When we are experiencing the glory... God chooses to work alone, and in this realm of rest, we can feel quite energetic or fine because we don't do anything. It doesn't cost us. In the Kabod glory, you don't feel like, oh, I've got to hold this up until he says stop. You just fold, and it's beautiful, and you did nothing, and he did everything. Does that make sense? When God changes teeth to gold because he can... They didn't do anything. They were just singing along and teeth change. Do you see what I mean? There was no dentist in that moment. All right? We are touched by him as he moves among us. We may be in a time of sweet worship and without praying or ministering to people, there are healings and miracles happening around the room. We work under the anointing, but we rest in the glory. We work under the anointing and we rest in the glory. Does that help? Another fruit of the glory is the ease in our ability to see deeper. We actually gain revelation. Um, It just makes sense. So we see a lot deeper. There's not a lot of questioning and doubts going on. That's not because we're those people and it has to be watered out of us. It's literally the realm of the glory as he gets to just reveal himself in a different way. It's so beautiful. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 to 8. For God who said, let brilliant light shine out of darkness, that's literal and metaphorical of spiritual revelation, the light, it's literal and it's metaphorical of spiritual revelation, revelation, learning, seeing. For God who said, let brilliant light shine out of darkness, is the one who has cascaded his light into us, the brilliant dawning light of the glorious knowledge, glorious knowledge of God as we gaze into the face of Jesus Christ or the face-to-face presence of Jesus. See how the oneness produces revelation. 
Oneness means we are encountering the light of God in a greater measure, like he is the light, the dawn light, the cascading light. So when we are in the place of oneness, we have greater revelation. Things in our own hearts make more sense. Strategies for things make more sense. Where things need to change or get better make more sense. Faith is established in a way that you didn't have to work for it. Things make more sense. Greater revelation. Do you understand? Another fruit or a benefit of the glory realm is the gift of knowing. We begin to know the mysteries of the kingdom in our spirit. Things that haven't yet been revealed get revealed. So this can be, I'll I'll go into, we become caught up in the things of his kingdom instead of the earthly things around us. So this is where strategies are so great. The blueprints, we often call them. The blueprints come in the glory realm. In the glory realm. The anointing helps us carry out what we caught in the glory realm. Do you understand? All right. Habakkuk 2.14, For the earth will be filled with the knowledge, the knowledge, the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's a lot of water. But he's not saying that we'll just have this blissful, there'll be knowledge, there'll be understanding, there'll be blueprints and systems and ways for how the kingdom operates here on earth, and it's all from the glory. Do you understand? The end times is heaven on earth, the glory realm on earth as it is in heaven. That's the end times, the glory realm on earth as it is in heaven. It's kingdom come. It's the king come. Another beautiful realm is that we see from God's perspective with ease and with clarity. Not only are we seeing, but we're seeing with ease. It's really important. Uh, Sometimes in the anointing, I'll see stuff and and it kind of grows as you keep going and it gets sharper and sharper. But when I'm in, especially in the prayer sets and you just feel the glory of God, you just, it's like, it's very easy to see. And it's like my screens have gone this wide. It's just totally different. It's like before I was looking through a keyhole and I just go with my faith and I just know and I can describe everything through my keyhole. Now I'm in a helicopter and I can see all around here. Do you see the difference? Ease. Ephesians 1.17. If you're looking into that, I don't need to go too much. The difference of the glory is he shows you heaven's point of view. So all his mysteries and strategies come with his point of view. Lastly and most astoundingly, The glory ram will show you the concerns and the delights of his heart. You step into that in the anointing. If you're in a place of worship, you're already trying to just be led by the the concern of his heart. That's just what it is. Worship is you're on the throne. So you're already leaning into that. And I, I, I believe that that place and that place that we've really practiced explored, tried to understand is I just want to know your heart. That perspective really attracts the glory because you're going, this is the only thing that matters. And it's not really unto great and glorious things, though those are very important. It's unto your heart is being revealed here on the earth and your heart matters. And it's come with the understanding, I think, in our community that he actually cares about ours. It's really powerful to have the power of God revealed in certain areas and we're all called to, you know, heal the sick and deliverance, it's all there and it's all part of, I'm not saying that it's not important, it's incredibly important and so essential, but to know the heart of God brings a lot of healing, a lot more healing than we realize to every person and knowing his heart for you and that your heart matters. There's a greater healing across the whole room when the understanding has been the heart of God, not just the one who's come in with a sickness that they know of. Does that help? Yep. All right. Mostly the concern is the light of his heart. Friendship becomes companionship in this place. You've not clocked in with your scheduled time. Once you have a taste of the glory of companionship, you're with each other all the time and it can stay in that kind of weightiness. I can be walking down, I long for this more, this is not a boast, but I can be walking down Rockingham and chatting with Luke and pushing Toby in his trike and I just feel this wind in my chest go boom. And I know it's the Holy Spirit. And we just have this other conversation at the same time. And I'm like, where would I be without... It's like a friend physically holding your hand for a second. Where would we be without just the courageous support of a hand being squeezed? Do you know what I mean? He wants that with you. He wants to be as courageously supportive with you as as he is. And in placing you within family that love you. And that's revealed to you that way. But he can do it too. He can manifest himself to you just to say it's going to be good today. Not, this is your assignment, do it well. It's, this is going to be good today. 
He can meet like that. And, and I have like 50 antenna that go off. I'm like, is this just you and me in a sweet moment? Or are you wanting me to say something in this moment? Should I just speak in tongues? Is it about this realm? And like I'm learning all the time. I'm trying to explore this realm. Is it to pray over this place that I'm walking? There are so many things to learn besides making it what you want it to be. But it's there and there's more. We become companions. We become the mature bride. We become mature lovers. We become ready for the groom. In the glory, we become ready for the groom, connecting with his heart. Ephesians 1, 17, 18, the Passion Translation says, I pray that the Father of glory, the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, would impart to you the riches of the spirit of wisdom and the spirit of revelation or discovery to know him through your deepening intimacy with him. Deepening, just like the waters, hey? I pray that the light of God will illuminate the eyes of your imagination, your innermost heart, flooding you with light, revelation, truth, not new age light, until you experience the full revelation of the hope of his calling. What are we called to? The hope of his calling. What are we called to? Oneness. Until you experience the full revelation of the hope of his calling. That is the wealth of God's glorious inheritance. What's his inheritance? Oneness. That he finds in us. We are his inheritance. And he is ours. In summary, when it comes to the glory realm, God is sovereignly moving. It no longer requires our faith or the anointing. God will sometimes reveal his Shekinah glory, so his manifest presence, you can see it, to human beings through physical phenomena such as fire or clouds or gold dust, miracles, signs, wonders, and at other times, he will reveal his kabod glory, which is an aspect of his nature. So the heaviness and the depth and the glory of his nature. And in his sovereignty, God takes the initiative and decides which aspect of himself he wants to reveal. In the glory, we have ascended and he is moving among his people. Of one thing we can be sure... The will of God has always been to dwell among his people, manifesting himself to humanity. As much as we might be uncomfortable, this is his will. He wants to manifest himself among his people. So, I'll leave it there. Super just opening books. I feel like I've just opened books and opened topics and it's okay to expose how we can journey more in things and explore more things. A couple of books I can recommend. I've been working through this book when we taught, but actually I grabbed more out of these two books, The Glory of God by, if you can pronounce his surname, good no, Gillam, mm -hmm, him, thank you. And then Moving in Glory Realms by Joshua Mills, excellent, excellent book. Um, but it's only out in paper, like download to your phone. So this is where the mice have chewed through the wires. This is what I'm talking about. It's, yeah, you can get it on Kindle, but, you, but it's not downloaded in print yet. But it's coming. But I really enjoyed that. I actually just moved it to my laptop and just went for gold. Um, so heaps of this content is coming, obviously, biblically, but it's through these two books as well. If you're wanting to figure out, like if this is exposing something in you, a hunger or a dissatisfaction or a sadness or whatever, please can we discuss this? Can you discuss it? Can you talk amongst yourselves? Can you explore it? Please don't shut it down. See, in one-to-one -one relationship, if something's a bit offy with me and Ebony, we discuss it because it's kind of obvious that I'm avoiding her. But with God, we can get away with it for years. Really. We can really get away with it for years. We can get away with lukewarm and justify it in a different way because we kind of thought lukewarm is like, <laughs> and it's sinful. When lukewarm is really, I've decided where it'll stop. So can you just talk amongst yourselves? Amy shared a bit about Life Hubs last week and how we're moving them weekly and how it's quite revealing our awkward of, oh, that's a lot of my time and I have to love selflessly and all these cool, funny things and other people are like, yippee, yippee, give me more and all this fun stuff that we have. And we're kind of held accountable in that exposure because it's weekly. That's what the prayer room is for this way. You might be someone who can 
really meet with the Lord and you've got time because of your season in life and you have a prayer room at home and that's wonderful. Um, my question to you is, if you have a spouse, do you find it easy to pray together? And if you don't have a spouse, do you find it easy to pray with someone else the way you would pray in secret? Because it's always both ends. We are the temple. We are the prayer house. And I pray with the Lord 24-7. Yes, me with him. But we are the prayer house. And we are the body. And we pray with the Lord 24-7. And shouldn't it be the same? So shouldn't it just reveal us where we find it awkward when we're trying to find out how to love him together? rightly the way he's asked which is praise worship that's how the prayer room goes it's praise worship glory that's what we do and in that place there's intercession and there's silence and whatever comes we don't have a all we do is what he's asked and then when we find out Woo but if you're finding like a it'll cost you da, 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 there's another part in your intimacy with the lord that he wants to grow you in and that's the exposing part <laughs> It's the next to someone else part. If we removed all these chairs on a Sunday morning and packed them out because equipping happens on a Sunday morning, right? But we were equipping you to be able to engage in worship the way we understand what praise and worship is. We understand it. We do. If we moved all the chairs, would you be comfortable with that? Would you feel like you could participate in a time of praise and worship as comfortably as you do now? Is the goal comfortable? Is the goal comfortable? So, I'm offering you an opportunity, I know it's not easy for all of us, but the prayer room, even for the prayer leaders, we're still learning how to do it together, is where you get the opportunity to discover where we can move more, where you can grow more, where you and God don't have a click, or um, I've never tasted this, I don't even know what intimacy feels like, let it come out in a revealing manner. If you don't know how to do quiet times and connect times with the Lord at home or while you're driving, come into the prayer room and taste it. Because what have we discovered by the glory? It's an experience before your understanding. So taste it, encounter it, let it reveal you, and then go into your families and discuss it and learn it and go into the Word and figure it out. But go from exploring, don't sit back in apathy with not knowing. All right? So it's almost weird because it's like, here, we're going to expose you with every week family times. And I'm like, yeah, and daily prayer sessions, pick one. But it's the reality of a moving church. We're moving. We're moving. I'm moving with the lamb. Moving with the lamb, I'm surrounded. We walked in the garden. We walked in the garden. And now you are the garden. We are the garden and we want to walk with the Lord. We want to walk with the Lord. So any part of you that just has resistance, I'm not saying speed up. I'm saying confront that. Hold, it, hold yourself accountable before the Lord on that. Uh, is that okay? Let the light reveal you. And it's a beautiful place to say. In our, one of our prayer times, we have some really rich times. One of our prayer times a couple of weeks ago, we just felt this repentance that we hadn't welcomed the truth enough. We welcome love, but we don't like welcoming it with truth. You know? And we were like, we welcome your light in. We welcome your light in. And it was this realization that we are, we are uh, firmly held and firmly established if we're in agreement with truth. But anytime we don't want to come into partnership with what the Lord's doing, where we put the no down, we lose truth. We lose light in our life. Wherever there's a uh, deal with it because you're losing truth and you're losing life and you're losing light in your life and you can't just assume that love only comes one way. Love is truth and truth is love. And it's really good to accept Jesus as truth, not just as soft and sweet and caring, all right? I can tell you now, the morning light is the softest light you've ever known. It's a really nice light. He can do a very gentle light. I'm hoping today was a gentle light. But don't run away from the light. Don't run away from greater things, from moving in. Is that all right? So if you're wanting to figure it out and practice it, the prayer room is open to you. The new times are for the next four months. Sorry for th people wondering when they are and, and the changes that have been happening. We've also been adjusting leadership as well. But these are the times for the next four months. And we put it on Instagram and we put it on Facebook if things change, usually by the beginning of that day, if not the day before. All right?
but you are welcome. There's always a prayer leader. If There's usually a team of three, but one main person is leading, and they'll be coaching you through where we're going while still trying to pursue what the Spirit is doing. And you get to share and participate, and even if you have some thoughts on it, you can share that with whoever's supporting that leadership. All right? There's room to grow. I bless you. Come running with me. Cool. So good. I just learned a whole lot. It's very good. Yeah. <laughs> so good. Yeah, uh, and, and thinking about it, I don't wonder if you've ever asked that question, like, why was it that every single person that Jesus prayed for just got healed? Why was it that every demon that Jesus cast out left? Um, and I think, you know, I mean, even that, that thing where the disciples couldn't cast out the demon, and Jesus said this only comes out through prayer and fasting, and I love what Bill Johnson reminds us, Jesus didn't pray and fast just then and then cast it out. He lived in that place, but, you know, he lived in the glory realm. So the sovereignty of God just moved. He's like, do this, and bang, it went, and um, yeah, he was in oneness. So good, so good. And, uh, and I do love that point, you know, the, the whole prayer room idea. Jesus, uh, when he comes into the temple and he overturns the tables and kind of sends people out and he says that my house will be a house of prayer and you know we're just really journeying through this idea but to understand um, a house of prayer this isn't a house of prayer this is a house of prayer and that the Lord desires that we would be a people of constant communion so even when you think about the prayer room it's like oh cool that's something oh that's something that we're doing now as a church Uh, the intention is to create opportunity to learn what it is to live in a constant state of communion with the father and to press into those places and those realms of glory and i do love it even you know like life hubs cause us to learn what it is to do relationship on other people's terms and i think the prayer room uh, causes us to to learn what it is to do relationship on god's terms because we can become so comfortable to say, well, this is just how I meet with God, and this is how I pray, and this is how I do my quiet time. And I just want to ask you to ask the Lord, is that what you desire? Is that how you desire to meet with me, Father? Is that how you, do you, do you want to dictate this relationship, Jesus, or should I just kind of figure it out? Whatever I feel comfortable with, whatever, you know, time I have available. Because I reckon the Father longs for more than just the way that you're doing it. I reckon he's got a better way. But uh, why don't we just pray and just open ourselves to whatever God wants to do. So, Father, we thank you, Lord, that you are inviting us deeper, Lord, that you are calling us higher, God. And Father, so much, uh, you know, just deep content, Lord, uh, coming out of your word this morning, Father. And and Lord, for everything that went over our head, we just thank you, Father, it's going to hit us in the eyes as we ascend higher. (laughs) Uh, Lord, that you're taking us into these deeper realms of understanding, Lord. But Father, at the end of it, God, what you're longing for is oneness with your people, oneness with your children, oneness with your bride. And God, we long for that, God. We long for those times where you just move sovereignly because we are so yielded to whatever you want to do that you can fully and freely just do whatever you want to do, Lord. And so, Father, I just pray for every heart, Lord, here today. That, Father, whatever realm in the river that we're in, whatever depth, God, that we will not feel any shame that we're not further in. But, Father, that you'll stir that hunger up in us, Lord, for those deeper places, God. And we'll say, yeah, Lord, I'm I'm not there, God, but I want to be. I'm I'm lacking, Lord, but I want want the more. So, Father, even as hunger essentially is an irritation in our physical body, Lord, that causes us to long for satisfaction, that you would stir up that hunger for the more of you and that would seek out the satisfaction of that hunger for greater measure of oneness and fullness and your glory. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.